when Christians use the word Advent, we are looking forward to what is coming. That's what Advent means. Literally, the word means to come. So, what is coming? Well, obviously, Jesus. We are looking forward to the birth of Jesus, to the celebrations of Christmas, to Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and the 12 days of Christmas, the, the whole Christmas story. But we are also looking forward to a new year. And hearing again the story of salvation, the crowning point of which is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The entire church year is built around the gospel. This new testament, this new testimony. Now, John the Baptist, who is a key figure of Advent, was nonetheless more of a prophet in the Old Testament sense than in the New. Jesus and John the Baptist often used the same words. Sometimes they meant the same and sometimes not. When John spoke of the kingdom of God, he was speaking in an Old Testament sense. Jesus used the same words but they described a different image, a new and surprising reality. What, what John looked for was the purification of Israel. This would occur by judgment, followed by the destruction of the unfaithful among Israel. This had long been the Old Testament prophetic solution to sin. Jesus, on the other hand, deeply values all human life, even sinful lives, and looked for their restoration to moral health. This is not purification. This is redemption. Yet it appears that Jesus early on felt a deep kinship with John's prophetic preaching, and with the intense commitment of his life to God. Jesus and John were thus, for a time, comrades, brothers in ministry. When Jesus was baptized by John in the River Jordan, apparently for the repentance of sin, that was a perplexing moment. However, God intervened and clarified the situation. You, he said to Jesus, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then Jesus received the confirmation from above. The Holy Spirit came down from heaven on him in the form of a dove. All this was completely new, completely unexpected. It, it was not so much a cleansing from sin as it was a full infilling of the Holy Spirit, a full infilling of the Spirit of God. Jesus was filled with the power of the Spirit. And as we know, he then spent 40 days fasting in the wilderness seeking to understand what all this meant. It turns out that it meant something quite different than what John meant. That's how it is with the kingdom of God. It surprises us. It's different from what we tend to expect. Forty days later, when Jesus returned from the wilderness from personally confronting Satan, he came preaching, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news of the gospel. Good news. 
The word gospel literally means this, good news. John had never conceived of this good news. And that is the situation that we see in today's gospel reading. That's why John the Baptist sent word by his disciples to Jesus. The reports of what Jesus said and did were confusing to him. They were very different from how he conceived the situation. And they are often very confusing to us. John the Baptist's preaching seemed to be that the kingdom of heaven was essentially bad news for many people. The religious types, you remember, he called broods of vipers. And most of the rest he called chaff, which would be burned up in an unquenchable fire. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire, he said. For what John looked for was the destruction of the morally unfit among Israel while Jesus looked for their restoration to moral health. And that is why, while we do admire John the Baptist, we love Jesus. But when Jesus came preaching, after his experiences at the Jordan and in the wilderness, He is proclaiming good news and he asks us to believe in this good news. If the gospel were easy to believe, Jesus wouldn't have had to ask us. We would just easily believe it. But he specifically calls us to have faith, to trust in what he says because Really, the good news is difficult to believe. It turns everything we have believed upside down. All that has seemed so obvious to us. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who are hungry. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. Blessed are those that mourn. But these are all upside down, reversal of values. The church spends its whole year working to help us to believe these hard-to-believe sayings of Jesus. Take, for example, God. God, whom we intuitively regard as a disapproving judge. That's what we think about. We're afraid of it. God, according to the gospel of Jesus, is actually a loving and forgiving father. A father we can admire and not fear. A good father a gracious father, better than any earthly father, a father who gives us, in the very best sense, what we don't deserve. It's hard to believe that God is really that good, that phenomenally good. Again, it's hard to square this good news up with the state of the world that God has created. Almost from the beginning, this world has always seemed dominated by evil. Good people get mistreated. Evil people rise to success. Bad things happen to good people. This seems true not only on a communal or tribal or national level, It is actually assuredly true on a personal level. If we will look 
We can see our own moral failures, our own sins. They are always before us. It's very hard to believe that good can somehow come out of them. It's hard to believe that sin, sorrow, sickness, despair, evil, disease, sickness, and death can be overcome by goodness. What Jesus preaches is a difficult gospel to believe. Yet Jesus says, turn away from believing in all this bad news and believe in the good news. It is important that we believe. Understand this, he says. You've got God all wrong. You think you know him and you don't. He is for you, not against you. He is not out to punish you. He wants to help you. And he wants you to know that. With his help, you can get this life right. But it will take his help. And Jesus says also very clearly, it will take my help also. So come to me, and I will refresh you. The good news is we are invited to partner with God. And we ask, why would God want to partner with someone as messed up as me? Why is Jesus dining with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus responds with the good news. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call righteous, but sinners. At this we complain, I don't understand how God can help me. Jesus replies, If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The answer to our complaint is very important good news. That is, God will do for you, if you want it, what he did for Jesus at the Jordan River. He will fill you with his Holy Spirit and his goodness will flow into you. The only thing is, you have to let it flow out to others. And that is what Jesus did. And if you do so, he will fill you back up again. This is the life, the good life. God's goodness flows into us, and God's goodness flows out of us to others. It is how we were meant to live. Living life like this heals us from the inside out and brings healing to those around us from the outside in. This is the good news of the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, believe in it. Now, people did not have difficulty believing John the Baptist. They swarmed out to John the Baptist. It made perfect sense to them that God's wrath should be coming. After all, wasn't God the great judge of the universe? And wasn't this a dark and sinful world standing in the need of judgment, requiring judgment? And then Jesus came saying things like, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me, he does not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. 
that is Jesus, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. That, for sure, is good news. But it is sure hard to believe. This new year for the church has begun. It began on Advent Sunday. And we are once again beginning to hear the proclamation of the gospel. Perhaps it's been too hard for us to believe thus far. But this is a new year. We have a new opportunity. The time is now. For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. There are a few of us who are able to believe how good the good news really is, and particularly the first time we hear it. It, it took Peter two years of face-to-face -face time with Jesus to even begin to get it. I started to believe it 46 years ago, and I'm still finding more goodness to believe in and more joy in believing. This believing is a long-haul project. Now I want to close with a story about a great believer. You've heard of him. His name is Thomas Aquinas. Thousands of high schools named after Thomas Aquinas. Hundreds and hundreds of colleges and universities named after Thomas Aquinas. He was a priest. He was a great theologian. He was a brilliant philosopher. He wrote volumes which helped people to believe in the gospel. Much goodness flowed into him and out of him. But on the feast of St. Nicholas in the year 1273, he was celebrating Mass when he received a revelation that so affected him that he wrote and dictated no more, leaving his greatest work, the Summa Theologia, unfinished. To Brother Reginald, his secretary and friend, he said this, The end of my labors has come. All that I have written appears to be as so much straw after the things that have been revealed to me. I can write no more. I have seen things that make my writings like straw. This, is, this man is considered the great doctor of the church, the great teacher of the church, Thomas Aquinas. I can write no more. I have seen things that make my writings like straw. Three months later, he died. But with a renewed and more deeply profound faith. It's a long haul process. Advent has come. The time is now. The kingdom of God is drawing near. Turn toward Jesus and believe in the good news of the gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.